Hey, everybody. It's Dwight. Of course, that's who's always here. Happy Yuletide, everyone, if you're the type to Yule the Tide. If you don't Yule any tides this time of year, hey, that's fine, too. This is the time of year where a lot of people have a winter holiday of one kind or another. So if you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or one of the other many traditions that people have around this time of year, whether secular, religious, or spiritual, or just having a good time with family and all the things you're doing, uh, this is a time of year that is generally, you know, thought of as that that way. I'm bringing to you um, the Christmas winter holiday time episode from uh, December 22nd, 2015, where Michael Denniston and I took a analysis of the movie It's a Wonderful Life. So I hope you enjoy that. Uh, there's a couple other reruns and then even a couple other period appropriate or uh, seasonal appropriate uh, uh, episodes that are brand new that are going to be coming out next week closer to the date where uh, Christmas is celebrated, at least in the U.S. and I think some other countries, but I'm, I'm not as sure. I know that there's different dates for others and then, of course, different dates for different holidays. So hope you enjoy this uh, kickback to uh, December of 2015. The Broken Brain. Welcome to the show, show, show. Yeah, happy ho ho holidays. Gosh, this is failing as an intro. Happy holidays. This is the Broken Brain, your weekly dose of mental health. This is, of course, our holiday edition. I'm Dwight Hurst, your host and psychotherapist and Capra fan, I guess. I don't know if I'm a fan of all things Capra, but we're talking about uh, the famous holiday movie made by Frank Capra. It's a Wonderful Life. Came out in 1946. We're going to be actually talking about that a little bit today. Uh, Michael Denniston, who is the host of War Machine vs. War Horse, is a big movie buff and movie expert and has agreed to come on and, and talk with me about that. So he's coming at it from the storytelling perspective and the movie buff perspective. I'm coming at it from the psychological perspective. One of the things I just want to say before we start is if you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life, you should. Um, yeah, I'm not going to give you a recap of, of, of It's a Wonderful Life because you should watch it. Uh, when we did our Halloween episode and we talked about A Nightmare on Elm Street, I give you a recap of that because you probably shouldn't watch that one. Uh, and I mean, you want to watch it if you want to. I don't care. But uh, this one you should if you haven't. And uh, go go do that now. Just hit pause. Watch It's a Wonderful Life, all three or four hours of it, and then come back. This is one of the uh, sort of perfect holiday movies that has survived over years and years and years. As I said before, it was made in the 40s, and it still survives. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons why, uh, especially from a psychological perspective, the things that we identify with that this movie uh, brings to us. A lot of emotions uh, that, that it obviously portrays and brings out. And I will say that this time of year is a time of year where we delve into lots of different emotions, uh, not all positive, by the way. Obviously, there's the joy of the holiday season. There's the excitement of family. There's all sorts of things that we delve into that are pleasant. Uh, but, you know, there's also expectations and stress and hardship and finances and, 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 and resolutions and things where we question our life. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot of things. Even going back to the days before Christmas was Christmas, when it was just uh, in days where there were more pagan ceremonies and celebration of lights that uh, that happened midwinter uh, from what what I've read and what I understand, a lot of those celebrations really just focused on the idea that, hey, here we are in the middle of winter, so let's let's try to you know put up some lights and celebrate that we're all not dead. We all haven't frozen to death and starved to death yet, and we're going to make it until the world is warm again and not, not trying to kill us quite so much. Um, so there you go. It's an emotional time of year. It's something that is uh, at the same time dark and bright, and we're going to, I think we, we capture that pretty well. Uh, so we're going to get into that, uh, my conversation with Michael, and uh, happy holidays. Thanks for being here. We look forward to being with you all throughout the next year, 2016. Oh, and by the way, our transition music today is the Odd Lang Syne Stick Mix Remix by Brian Steckler. Brian Steckler is an audio composer and 
virtual genius with this kind of stuff, uh, you should check out his YouTube channel, Brian Steckler, as one word. It's Brian with an I, B-R-I-A-N, Steckler, S-T-E-C-K-L-E-R. You can find a link to that on the, the website as well. And check out the Odd Lang Sign Stick Mix Remix for all of your holiday parties. Hey, yeah, you changed your picture. That's what it was. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I was like that. scrolling through. No, you're, yeah. Yeah, you should apologize for changing your picture. Um, <laughs> how are you doing, Michael? I, I'm good. Any excuse to watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life, which I oh, you know, awesome. usually would have done by this point. I usually kind of jump on early December, but <laughs> I, uh, I miss the, um, like they always do a screening here yeah. at a couple of theaters, and I, uh, didn't get a chance to see it. I, so. I never, I never make it to to those. They do the big one on TV. It seems like, and I don't know if it's in the public domain, but it seems like they show it on every channel. I was actually just reading up on that. I had no idea, but uh, yeah, it used to be in the public domain uh, until I think 1990. Then so, you, uh, then you purchased it, right? Is that it's yours now? Yeah, I purchased it on a Blu-ray for the uh, War Machine podcast. They have the rights now. Oh, yeah, I, I wish. Uh, I, I would not be in the podcast business then. <laughs> I would just be you know, pawning off terrible sequels or prequels and try to expand the mythology. <laughs> that, would, that would be, hey, talk about a multiverse. <laughs> yeah. the, it's a Wonderful, it's a wonderful life. life, Phase 3, coming this summer. <laughs> well, we're just, we're just plowing right in, by the way, so anything we say now, <laughs> Canon will be used against you on, that, on the interweb. <laughs> I, I saw a version of it a few years ago. I've watched it many, many times. I actually love it as well. It's funny because I, I kind of put this out there to a bunch of people and said, hey, you want to come talk about this? And as it worked out, I should have done it probably earlier in the season. You and I are the only ones with the with, – and, and maybe it's because we're the big fans. It seems like that was the reaction I got was we're the diehards, but <laughs> we're the, the wonderful lifers. Uh, yeah, that, that's strange. Uh, if anyone has listened to my podcast, they probably would not expect that because I'm fairly, I guess, cynical and grouchy. I'm, I'm Potter, basically, <laughs> and Potter style. You're, you're, that's why. Is that why you like it? <laughs> you're, now, that, that's the thing is if you love it, it sounds sweet until you say, my hero is Mr. Potter. <laughs> <laughs> now, that I wanna, guy. I want to be just you, like him. Did you see what Pottersville looked like? It looked pretty happening, pretty swinging. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine being the guy cashing all those checks from that place. <laughs> You got sexy women, you got gruff men, drinking, you browsing. Got, this is, you got a, a, a joint with where we serve hard drinks for people who want to get drunk fast. So no chit-chat, no conversation with your fellow man. You don't ever need anybody bringing the joint character or whatever, yeah. I Yeah, so um, – yeah, who knows? That's the first impression. No, no Jimmy Stewart impressions first. I was doing Nick, the bartender. Are you, Which, you're going with a bit of a deeper, deeper pull there. Deeper yeah, cut. Yeah. Well, you know, I, people have a certain expectation coming into it, and it, it's. A, I saw a version of it. I was going to say though, the, it was a, a stage version. It was a radio play version. I don't know if you've ever seen when they do that, but they basically have the actors doing it. It's almost a reader's theater, but they set up microphones in front of them. And they do it like it, it was actually one that was done for the radio, either either before or right around the time the movie actually came out. So hmm. in the forties. Now, are you familiar with the uh, the short story, the the greatest gift that's based on? Uh, no, you know what? You go for it. I'm not. I, I'm not as well. I didn't even know <laughs> until you know about ten minutes before this recording. I was like, I should probably. Yeah, you know, just do my cursory Wikipedia uh-huh. thing yeah, because yeah. the uh, the special features uh, on the particular Blu-ray I own are pretty limited. Like it looked like it was a uh, early '90s like sort of Turner Classic movies. Like you know, mm-hmm. hey, here's the movie you just watched, and isn't it great? And here's why it's great. It's like, yes, I know that. Um, but apparently, they, they said the same thing that the, uh, the he couldn't sell the short story, and so okay. he. Um, the author sent it like as a Christmas card to like 200 of his closest friends and oh, family. Oh yeah. Okay. That's cool. Like, that's, a, that's a pretty badass Christmas card. The story <laughs> of it's a wonderful life. Like, it's like, wow. Imagine, you know, there's people out there who got that Christmas card 
And here's the thing, because just people being people, right? You know that there's there were people who 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 were like, Oh, I'm so grateful. This is awesome. This was a short story, You'd sit down, read it with the family, this obviously talented friend of mine. I, but you know there were people <laughs> who got it and were like, Oh, this guy. Uh, sure thinks a lot a of himself. Of dog. That's all I really want. <laughs> and, and and but here's the thing: if you could track down those people, they're probably all dead now. But if you could track down those people and talk to them, guarantee a hundred percent of them would tell the first story. Right. <laughs> Even if they were the ones and, who were like, "Oh no, yeah, and my you're writer not gonna friend." Get somebody who did the like too long, didn't read version of that card, where they sort of did not get to admit it. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be like, oh, no, I was one of the ones. Just like everybody who was alive during the civil rights movement, nobody wants to say I was the guy who, who didn't uh, support civil rights. They all want to say I was the guy who totally was on board. Yeah. So Yeah, based on the uh, you know survivors' accounts of people who lived it, it sounds like it should have been a very easy thing to get done. Then. <laughs> Where was the opposition? <laughs> just like how everyone was at Woodstock. I've now compared <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life to <laughs> – the civil rights movement and Woodstock. Um, I'm not sure how well that'll stand. But. Well, so so you you say like a, a and you should give a, a give a plug here right up at the top here for your podcast, War Machine versus War Horse. Yeah, it's a, a movie podcast. One of uh, I don't know ten that are out there. Yeah, so we're, I guess I guess we're like the eighth best of those ten. There's uh, not very many movie podcasts out there. <laughs> no, uh, I will say there's not you know many good ones. I'll yeah, there you go. <laughs> I actually I'll, I'll I'll hit the plug too. Where I, I really like the format of your show because you you do well. Say what it is. You it's your show. You can describe the format. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm used to, to doing that. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of a uh, complicated format, so you really need to be, I guess, like a big time movie fan. Uh, it's not one where you can listen to every episode uh, unless you want to get spoiled, I guess, because uh, the premise is we do a very brief, usually spoiler free uh, conversation about a new release. Um, so if it was, say, you know, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, uh, we would talk about that for about 15 to 20 minutes and then uh, choose a theme. Uh, based on that new release to expand the conversation to two older films that uh, approach that theme in different ways. So I believe for Star Wars, we're going to be doing a New Hope special edition versus the Phantom Edit Ah, because our our particular theme is uh, bringing Star Wars back and trying to fix it, which has been done. seems like I've spent most of my life hearing about Star Wars being fixed more so than just enjoyed. <laughs> so that that's sort of the approach we're going to take because it would be very hard to just flat out compare A New Hope and Phantom Menace and have a very interesting conversation about it. That's very cool. I was wondering what you're going to do with it. I've noticed uh, I, it, we're, we're both part of that same podcast group on Facebook, and I noticed a few people were posting about that they were going to looking forward to seeing that movie. Um, just a few, just a more couple. so for sisters. I think <laughs> Tina Fey is going to take the weekend. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's going to be number one. <laughs> <laughs> Sisters with Tina Fey and Amy Poehler is gonna gonna trump over the Phantom Minute. No, no, whatever it's called, Force Awakens. I just saw it last <laughs> night, actually. So I should know that. Gee, Ooh, you just you just lost. Your I lost my nerd card. Thing. Oh no! But I still have a podcast, so it it helps. It re- it auto renews. <laughs> well, we won't get into that uh, uh, as much. I'll, I'll look forward to hearing that. So yeah. I, and that's what I like about your show. It's really clever and really gets into when I was on your show. I, I really actually enjoyed feeling like I could talk about movies the way I really want to, which is let's really get into it um, <laughs> without feeling like anyone was like, okay, shut up, you know? So, and that, that's what I really liked about it. Yeah, and it's meant to be like, you would just have a conversation walking out of the movie, going to a bar with your friends. That's, yeah. that's what we're trying to get at there. Cause we don't, you know, we don't do, ratings or rankings or anything like that it's just we just yeah. have the conversation and, that's it. and one of the things i also like uh is that it is that it's funny but not not necessarily snarky if that makes sense like you can uh, sometimes it, it's not just a a uh, bad movie podcast or making fun of movies you really love the movies but you can still laugh with them and at them occasionally so yeah, yeah. We're, we're not considered snarky because we're not that clever that's yeah. it we're not that smart <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a cutoff for snark. So, so with that, you say, you know, you, you feel like people would be surprised, you know, because you're usually a little uh, more cynical maybe with that. And, and here's the thing. I, I notice It's a Wonderful Life has been part of my life for so long that when I go back and watch it now, I think with everything, you watch it a little differently the older you get. And the very first time I saw it, I didn't catch the some of the maybe less 
uh, I don't know, less modern or less progressive, more, I don't know, a little bit of racist uh, relation toward their maid kind of a thing that – uh, the things like that that you catch later as you get a little older that you're like, oh, this is the reason why sometimes I don't like things when I get older. Mm-hmm. But I've also noticed that that hasn't happened to me. I haven't like turned against it. <laughs> I, I mean, don't know. You, you certainly have to put it you know, in the context of its time. And it, sure. it, that, that particular sequence does stick out where uh, you know, their, their maid is both a part of and – distinctly not a part of their family and he jimmy stewart even when he's you know good guy jimmy stewart sort of draws that line like yes. you know are you gonna pull up a chair like you know to sit down with us like as if that's the most absurd thing in the world like <laughs> like to to be a part of them. but <laughs> as his brother know, gently sexually harasses her i think is uh, yes. for one scene <laughs> and you know even the i would say the uh the, the romance here uh with his, his wife mary is uh you know is is the popular term especially on twitter would be considered problematic the uh the first mm-hmm. kiss i was watching it with my fiance and i was like wow the 40s they were very violent uh i guess the, <laughs> the plot way would say he's being passionate at that moment but he seems like that's a very angry first kiss <laughs> well and so i think that gets into uh one of the things that i wanted to say up top about it uh what I was going to say, one of the things I like about it, and I didn't mean to tie it exactly to that first kiss, because I had that same, I have that same reaction when I watch movies from the 40s where I'm like, whoa, they're really going at it as far as the kiss. You know, for, for a time where you couldn't show, I, and I'm mixing up times a little bit here, but you couldn't show Elvis's hips on, on TV, they were sure uh, uh, doing some, some, some mouth action there as far as like <gasps> getting right on each other um, violently. But I think that ties in with that this was only. Uh, I want to say, I don't know how many decades, but it was only somewhat removed from stage acting, uh, which now, of course, you have movie actors who are just movie actors, of uh, of course, but they ha- they projected things almost the way you would on stage, very big and very, very over the top. And I remember one of the first times, uh, probably the first time that I had watched the whole movie because you, it's one of these things that's in our cultural periphery, right? And and when I saw the whole movie, the thing I was impressed with was here was a guy, and and I think it, part of it had to do with the fact that he's a man, and he was so emotional. Uh, that was the thing that I just remember about it was that all of the emotions were so powerful. He's when he was upset, he's just furious, and when he was happy, he's screaming it out and running up and down the streets. And I think there was something that I identified with at that young age of just this passionate, emotional person, man, and, and, and trying to think about that. And I maybe just hadn't, hadn't had people in my life who were that, that passionate about every single emotional expression. And, and it impressed that upon me. Well, he's certainly in an extreme situation uh, here and we do get to look back at the course of his life. So uh, to me, like, I don't think, you know, our day to day lives, we allow ourselves to be that, that big and that broad because uh, we don't have that perspective, the, that sort of ripple effect that we have yeah. in other people's lives. And uh, if you do go around thinking like that, you're, I would say you're probably very self involved if you're constantly <laughs> thinking about how you've affected others well, in a positive way. <laughs> sure. And actually, it's a really good point because George Bailey doesn't look at himself that way for sure, particularly when he's in, in the midpoint and beginning point of the movie uh, where he's contemplating suicide. Um, and, and this is also an interesting thing because for its time, uh, I, I'm probably going to misuse this term. So you, you're the movie buff here. You, you know, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, it's almost a sort of nonlinear storytelling. It's still linear in a way where it's showing his life, but it's like, we start out with like the first, I don't know if it's the first half, but it seems like a big portion of the movie is Clarence, the angel before we ever visually meet him getting a, a tutorial from, some head angel who who's like saying, okay, here's the, the guy. you got to watch his life from childhood on. And getting that very – right away you're starting to get a feel for who this person is in a way that you wouldn't necessarily get if they just showed that story unnarrated. It's a it's an inside outside thing. Like we yeah. we start as the audience, we don't know who he is. So we we have Clarence's perspective. Like, okay, tell us tell us why should why should we care? about George Bailey. And so very quickly, I mean, it helps as Jimmy Stewart that, that helps sure. to kind of win our hearts there. Uh, but you know, when you get to the end of the film and they, they kind of double back and they want to do that, uh, Christmas Carol thing where, 
we're going to see, you know, what life would have been like this alternate, you know, Earth 2 or whatever. Um, suddenly we're totally Another Earth is the spiritual sequel to this. Yeah. <laughs> deep but cuts. I, I think, Speaking I think of deep cuts. Yeah, yeah. that is. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it is a really interesting way to – uh, to get us caught up because otherwise this could have been it's so as you said emotionally big you can't have this be a three-hour epic you know we if you're gonna do like a life story and then do this alternate reality about this man's life if he had not been there uh you, you can't really tell it in a way where we go just in a standard fashion of here's his childhood here's his high school years here's college because it, my goodness you're just gonna be beat to death by the you're going to want to jump off that bridge too by the time you get to the end of it. So I yeah. think it expedites the process. And and it was a clever way to do it because it, it right away it, – it doesn't really apologize for a couple of assumptions, right, which is that angels are there. That's her thing. Right off the bat, just get deal with it. And they're intervening somehow in this person's life. So as we meet George Bailey, what – obviously we're supposed to fall kind of in love with him as a character uh, as Clarence – you know, as his guardian angel does, where where he's like, oh, I really want to help this guy, and he really deserves it and needs it. Um, what are you, what are some of your thoughts as we watch him develop? What are we supposed to take from it? And what what do you take from George Bailey? I think he's a man that uh, you are supposed to respect, but I, I don't know if the film is saying that uh, all of his qualities have led to a life that you know you would necessarily want to live. He's he's basically man who has a great capacity to take a beating mm-hmm. like and i <laughs> i don't know if that's going with the sort of small town values that they're sort of uh spousing here but he is someone that uh can you know pick himself back up and i guess that's the tragedy when we get to the end of the film is that he's contemplating you know laying down this is the final yeah. battle final fight uh you see it early on when he's a kid and he's got this uh this little part-time job which is always cracks me up to see like you know basically like grade schoolers like working on a counter like you know handling money or anything like that and Um, and medication (laughs) yes it's a pharmacy right um but we see in that sequence where he understands that his boss this uh this pharmacist is uh has you know experienced a tragedy he's lost his son i mean it's it's done in a very sort of old fashioned and I don't think that would be acceptable now in a modern filmmaking way where you just like zoom in on just like this uh you know this uh note that's been left on the counter that's like by the way your son has died. <laughs> it's like right. that's, that's it. <laughs> it, was, uh, <laughs> it would be considered a little ham fisted by today's yeah, right. Yeah. Um but knowing that he he knows that his boss, this older man, he can tell he's upset. He has that information And he's been drinking and he knows that he's made a mistake and he tries to go to his father, you know, as you would expect a child would be like to inform an adult, like you need, we need to help this man. Something bad is going to happen. And he's unable to get that help because of Potter, you know, the coolest guy in town kicking, you know, (laughs) kicking ass and taking names. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, when he, and I read in the original, I guess the original script, he attempts uh, to get his uncle Billy to help more. Okay. And they just they just drop that notion because it really in the film it's like you know if he couldn't get his father's help, he kind of like dismisses very quickly anyone else. Yeah. Um, but I think that that tells you all you need to know about who this man will be and what he'll he'll grow up to be, which is kind of tragic. Yeah. That he will he'll take the beating. I mean, he gets slapped around. His ear starts to bleed. Right, uh, because he's willing to stand up for the right thing, even though it puts him uh, in a you know very personally and professionally tough position, and that's going to happen repeatedly throughout the film. It, it's it's a really interesting thing because even at that point, we see. I, I've always I've heard several people say this. My wife and I've talked a lot about this. Of George Bailey is the kind of guy, the kind of person that you want to be after you watch when you watch this movie. You want to be him, but you don't necessarily want to endure all the things that he's endured and give up all the things he's given up and compromise all the things he's compromised. Um, but we all kind of wish we could be that person who's like, I'll stand up for what's right, even if Mr. Gower is going to make me bleed from my ear. Um, and, and that's the thing. Here's an interesting thing is here's Mr. Mr. Gower, the druggist, you know, who, who's, uh, you know, some uh, probably an important guy around town. He's an, he's one of the more educated people. He's a medical professional or whatever. And, uh, th- and here's George, who's already, in a way, in the, at least in this moment, a better man than him. 
At least there's, I, I think that's what they're showing because here he hits a child and when he realizes he's wrong, to his credit, he, he immediately, oh, I'm so sorry, George, you know, you saved me. And George is just like, it's okay, it's no big deal. Basically wanting to just mm-hmm. forgive him right away and be gracious where that's not what he was a minute ago. And, and so you have this, this character who's already like, I just want to help. I just want to do what's right and I want you to feel okay. I understand that you lost your son. And it's interesting because uh, there are many opportunities for George Bailey to lash out throughout the film. And I, I hadn't really noticed that, you know, when I watched it when I was younger, I just thought it was sort of a, just a generic feel good movie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe the best one, especially around the holidays, but I thought it was a very easy message. Uh, as an adult, when you, you know, you start to give up on your, your hopes and dreams and desires, and you're like, I just, I hope I can just sleep today i hope i can just <laughs> like sleep and I, I hope the boston celtics win you know tonight. Yeah. that's all i hope for anymore in the world um I, I started to see him as a very tragic and but there's still a strength within him like yeah you know, when he's facing enormous uh pressures yeah i mean the most he does to his children is he basically wants them to be quiet yeah. like and you put that in he context, gets grumpy yeah yeah, I mean, with basically, that's like everybody loves Raymond. That's like every episode where he just wants his kids to shut up and not be like seen. But this is like this he's is his possibly rock bottom. Yeah, he's going to lose her by his money, so he has good reason to be short with yeah. his kids. So that that just shows like the capacity he has to to be able to sort of internalize these things and sort of put it all on his shoulders, which other people are unable to. Yeah, and, and I think it, it does a good job of really showcasing uh, the role that expectation plays in our lives because he, from a very young age, is like I'm going to see the world and I'm going to get out of this town and I'm going to build exciting things and I'm going to do things. And this is this is something that I noticed that I thought was really interesting is. At that point you're talking about where he is rock bottoming and he's upset, he goes home and he's got this little table in the corner where he still pursues drafting or architecturing, I believe is what they call it, uh, as a hobby of some kind. He still like draws these things. You can tell that his dreams are now just like a little hobby he does in his off hours. And he just trashes it, like pushes it off the table. And and of course that's very, you know, symbolic of him resenting all these sacrifices and compromises for, you know, where he's at and everything. Um, But I think that nowadays we would want to see the message or we would, I don't know. I I think nowadays we might look at it as if, well, that's what he's supposed to do is give up the banking and give up everything and pursue being an architect or making that dream come true is the realization of, of this epiphany. You know, kind of a uh, not not to pick on anything in particular, but like a like you know more along the lines of an eat, pray, love, or more along the lines of a oh, just change my whole life around what I want to do, and of course the universe and the world will support me in making my dream come true because that's we all know is what happens when you give up practicality for <laughs> living your dreams. Uh, and, and the movie never revisits that as as a resolution. He doesn't need that th- that his expectations at that moment are off, I think is the message of the movie that that's not what he needs I, to be happy. Yeah. You know, I think that's clearly a change from you know, 1946 to 2015. Uh, the, the scene I was thinking of, uh, I've not seen eat, pray, love. So I, I apologize to your listeners for not being able to do a, a deep dive on that, on that one. I missed that one. I, you know uh, what? I'll confess to, I I'm, I'm just giving into like kind of the hype of what it's about, I think, which is just kind of a self reinvention and, 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 and possibly throwing that under the bus of just the kind of feel good, uh, uh, you know, reinvent yourself message. It could be great. I have no idea. I was thinking of, uh, up in the air. Have you seen that? The George Clooney, uh, film. Uh, he, oh. he plays plays a guy who his job is to lay people off, uh, okay. basically, and he has no attachments and connection. He has this. Uh, it, it's just a very you know small, uh, brief appearance by J.K. Simmons, who is one of the many people throughout the film that he's he's laying off this company. And uh, you know, since George Clooney is Clooney, and he's very slick. Right. Uh, he has just the right thing to say to this guy to basically stop him from being upset with him at that moment, even though he really doesn't care what's going to yeah. happen to this guy. Like he'll never see him again. Uh, he looks at his uh, resume and notices that he he went to school like a um, uh, culinary school at one point, and yeah. then ended up somehow like an insurance. And so his sort of spin on this is 
um, you know, weren't you really wasting your time? Like clearly this job, even though you don't want to lose it, was not your passion. You know, shouldn't you spend right. the rest of your days pursuing your passion? And he's able to kind of get that. And I think that speaks to what you're saying to where sure. nowadays you could kind of sell that idea to people. Like, yeah. yes, this, I should, you know, the universe will support my passion. Clearly they've not seen the latest NBC broadcast of it's a wonderful life. The universe is going to bear <laughs> down on you and say, you're going to be stuck in Bedford falls, no matter what you try to do. <laughs> and <laughs> you're staying. Yeah. And, and you see those, those, and, and there's that very, uh, there's a very dramatic moment where it's like he's about to walk out, and it's like, but if Potter will win if you walk out right this second. And, and, and it's funny because just like you say, we don't see the ripple effect in real life. And, of course, that's obviously part of storytelling. We usually don't have that one moment where it's like dreams coming true on this side of the door, doing the right thing on that, going through that door um, at the cost of dreams. Let me tell you, my fiancé had a huge issue with that sequence where they're – like counting this, you know, yeah. stacks of fat cash and getting ready to go on their honeymoon. And like, we're going to go here. We're going to go there. It's going to be great. And that's when the rain comes in. And it's like, you know, the cabbie is like, hey, look, there's something going on at your place of work there, Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> Maybe you should go check on it. And my fiance was like, don't get out that door. Don't like, do, it. do not get out. <laughs> and there goes the honeymoon. Like, right. Even, even that, like, you know, I think for most people, even if they stay kind of, stuck in a, a place or a job that maybe weren't you know necessarily their dreams they have moments yeah. of uh their fantasies coming true and it may be your honeymoon you know, yeah it may be a vacation you take but this movie is brutal when it comes to george bailey he doesn't even get yeah. the honeymoon he doesn't even get the honeymoon right that he obviously had saved up you know and that had unless that was the bank's money i wasn't really clear on that yet. <laughs> He, There's an alternate you know, version of this where he's a criminal. He's embezzling. Money. He's been embezzling. The savings loan would have done better if you weren't stealing. No, in fact, I think it's the opposite. Is he puts his personal money into the savings and loan at that moment yeah. to try to help it, because yeah. and it shows how you could you could easily look at that and say, wow, you know how misguided and how here he's doing something that he feels like at the end of the day, I'm just trying to survive. I'm just trying to do my best. I'm trying to do the right thing, and it's all worthless. And, of course, the, the ultimate message at the end is here. here's a, a time where uh, – and a moment where you can realize that, no, it hasn't. Actually, you've made all the difference to people's lives. And, of course, and of course it's, it's, it's very dramatic, like you say, it, and it's a very brutal – a, a brutal delivery of that, that thing that is in reality where, yeah, no, nope. You don't get that. You don't get this uh, nice time, or you don't get a break from what's going on. Um, well, that, that, that's the, the you know the cross to bear there. If you're going to have that much of an effect, like he's an interesting character because why does he why does he even really want to pick a fight with Potter? Like it's you know even Potter's like I guess you know one of his underlings. It's like you know what we can't understand about this guy is he is basically competing against your customers, like the people mm -hmm. who will be renting from you. But he's not even profiting off these houses that he's helping these people like buy for themselves. Like they're worth double, you know, what he's yeah. basically getting out of it. So he's an interesting character in that he, we don't see quite a bit uh, of his professional dealings. Like we see when there's problems with the money, but we don't really right. see why he wants to uh, sort of get rid of Potter's control of that area. Other than that one little bit incident with his father, when he dares to say something about his dad, it's like, did that stick with him? Like for yeah. the rest of his life to like take on the big guy. Yeah. Yeah. I no. And it's really interesting too, because you can see where like in, in that meeting or wherever, where he wants to leave, he wants to go. And, uh, but they'll only vote if he's in charge because he's the one with that passion. You know, it's funny because just a week or so ago, I think it was, uh, CNN just had their annual uh, CNN Heroes. I don't know if you ever watched that. It's like an award show for humanitarians. Uh, and it's funny because when you see things like that and you see people that are operating something that seems to be a really successful thing that's helping people, I, I it's always funny to me because uh, – when, when uh, successful humanitarian things make it really, really big, they get passed on to a new generation, and they usually lose something because it's not that person. And and when you see the the people that they bring up, they're not people who are like, hey, I figured out how to make a billion dollars, you know, bringing water to Africa or or African nation, uh, rural Africa or whatever. No, it's a, usually a person who's like, I'm operating an orphanage in Nepal, or I'm bringing water to rural Africa on a shoestring budget where I'm not really making anything, and I'm not really, and I'm mortgaging and compromising a lot of the things that I could get because I'm a talented person elsewhere. But I'm just 
surviving. And, and it's like what you say with the houses that he's building and that he's giving money to people. He's not trying to profit, and the savings loan isn't making money off of it. It's it's like it the thing that he's doing is the reward of what he's doing, if, if, if that makes some sense. And I think that's a little bit counter to what we're taught sort of in, in a modern sense. I, th- I think the economy and money and survival is so difficult and important that, that many times we are trying to say, oh, you know, how can we cash in on something? How can I use whatever it is, this, this new software platform, this new app development thing to, to you know, make money or do things instead of saying, how can I do something I feel good about as its own reward? That just is kind of a, more and more an alien concept, I guess. I feel like that's where I don't know what the ending. I mean, it, it always like brings a tear to my eye when I watch it. Yeah. But I also get that hint because of that, where I'm looking at James Stewart's face and I'm thinking, is that like, is that the last straw for him as far as like, has even the town of Bedford Falls been taken from him? Because, you know, as you said, he was getting nothing out of it, except he was getting to sort of like shape this town in this, this sort of image, like, you know, this hard work, basically the image of his father, like to just, yeah. you know, to do good and help out your community. When he has that sort of nightmare, you know, sequence where he sees himself removed from this community it's like, yeah, it's cool that you had that much influence on people, but dear lord, it's like they pulled their masks off and revealed they're all monsters. Like, they, you know, like <laughs> well, like, I will say, on a, you know, on a kind of joking around, and this is one of those that I, I think this movie is like a family member. Like, like you know, your family members well enough that you can bust on them and kick them around mm-hmm. and whatever, and still love them more than take a yeah. bullet for them, whatever. And I kind of feel that way about this movie because it's been around so long. Because I'll get around with my. My uh, siblings, my sibling in laws, whatever, we'll we'll kind of joke around about uh, uh, Nick the bartender, best guy in the world. But when, but for some reason, when George isn't there, he's a psychopath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and by the way, also you know he's he's not only is he like really rude and mean, uh, he has his own. He's the one who owns the bar. He, so it's actually in some ways financially better for him because <laughs> Mr. Martini wasn't. Able to, uh, uh, you know, be as successful, I guess. So there's some funny little things that you see there where everybody, yeah, kind of falls apart uh, without him there. Well, uh, and, and then get to uh, Mary, get to his his wife. Like, um, you know, uh, just my initial impulse when I'm watching the end of the film, you know, she's the one that takes charge. Like he falls apart and, you know, is yeah. the other half of this marriage. She, you know, she picks up the slack. She She's there for him. Uh, when he's down and she sort of rallies the troop, rallies the town uh, to get together. But uh, I find it kind of disturbing that in the, uh, without the him. Earth 2, without him, she is nothing. She's right. person- personified by you know being uh, an old maid who just works at the library. And I'm like, really? Is and, that – You know, and <laughs> here's – yeah. Which, which, by the way, is the worst possible thing in the world is to not have a man and work in a library. Those are the just just terrible things. Your life must be awful if you don't you're not married and you work in a library. I don't know why that's that's the hell of this. No, but <laughs> it's so, a different different mentality. Yeah, that's said in Dante somewhere. But no, I, I um I think it's I think that's one of those things too. Not to be defensive of it because I totally agree. I watch that with a little. It makes me a little queasy too. Where I'm like, you know, she's that's not really in keeping with her personality. I kind of chalk that up to the time where I think that was the archetype they were trying to go for. Was that, you know, anyway. Well, and on obviously it's a it's a one key play at that time where it's like uh, everybody's worse off without you. Would have it it kind of would have been a different movie if it's like ah she's she's fine. Yeah, she's all right. She went off and married that rich she guy. She married that rich really guy. successful in plastics. <laughs> <laughs> and here's what she's doing now. Um, yeah, because actually, you know, honestly, uh, th- th- and this brings up something that uh, just from a psychological perspective, when I work with people uh, in, in therapy and things, and we talk about uh, the idea of relationships and, co- and especially in couples counseling, you know, I find that, that real people, not storybook people, 
uh, real people don't actually want to be with someone who needs them. You know, Romeo and Juliet is a is a teenage fantasy play where, you know, we literally, if we can't have the one we love, we'll kill ourselves. And there's a romantic notion to that. But in real life, if you, you know, like if, you're, if your fiancé or like if my wife or, or if vice versa, if we said to them, hey, you know, like I really mean it. If we, we ever weren't together, I would actually literally kill myself. You know, nowadays that's considered a form of controlling domestic violence to threaten suicide if someone leaves you. <laughs> and, it's very off-putting. <laughs> and even if it wasn't a threat, it wouldn't necessarily be attractive. Be like, right. oh, really? Ugh. Like you could not live – you really couldn't function without – no, I really mean I could not function all without you. I don't think – you know, th- just lumping you, me, and our spouses together, you know, the, the four of us, I don't think any of us would be like turned on by that. We, we'd be more like and, – and so the reality is you actually want to be with someone who is strong and is independent and they would hate to be without you, but they'd be all right. And, and I think in reality Mary, the character that we're shown throughout the rest of the movie – uh, and I think – doesn't she even like wear glasses as the librarian, but she doesn't wear glasses when she's right. married to him? What happened to the uh, you know the young girl who had that cannon for an arm? It was you know, yeah, break, exactly. like breaking out windows. It was like, like, like this tough – right. Um, yeah. She didn't find the right guy, and so you know, right? yeah. So there's some – there's obviously some a bit of problems there. Uh, yeah, uh, totally. And, and that's where I see it's not a perfect – it's a – in some ways – the perfect Christmas movie or a perfect movie by the standards of storytelling and for the time, but very imperfect by today's standards with some of those messages. You have to be careful about internalizing those, I think. Um, and that, let's not give Hollywood too much credit. You know, it's not like they've made too much progress in 2015 when it comes to, you know, uh, equal roles as far as genders yes. uh, in these type of stories. So, well, you uh, know, it's funny because you you just saw and I just saw the the Force Awakens, right? And right. we're all celebrating now that there, here's a female character who really at no point throughout the movie, minor spoiler, I guess, really at no point throughout the movie is she rescued by a dude, not mm-hmm. really. Um, and and that's we're celebrating it in 2015, <laughs> right? So patting ourselves on the back, right? We got that one solved. <laughs> exactly. Sexism is now over. Thank goodness. <laughs> At least the movie accomplished that. But you know, it, it's one of those things where you'd think we'd be a little further along in in sort of those equal ways of storytelling, but but we unfortunately are not. So yeah, there you go. But I I think that uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about. Well, let me ask you this one. I've got a couple, but uh, what about his dad? Now, uh, we don't really meet his dad in any real form. I think if there's too much of him in the film, then it would run counter to, I think, Capra's intent or his message. Uh, Because if we see James Stewart just becoming his father, uh, I think you start to question more, like, should you have really stuck around Bedford Falls? Like, because I don't want, as we were saying earlier, we, we admire him, but we don't necessarily want to have the same experiences that he does. And, uh, yeah, that that's a, just a, a natural thing to where, you know, this is a man who dies early. Like, the mm-hmm. job kills him, and he's, you know, belittled by Potter in that one sequence. We don't want to see Jimmy Stewart become that. I think that's why he's not on the screen that much. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I know. I'm with you. I, I think it's an interesting thing where because he's not there, he can become this archetype sort of this this in the background. Parents are kind of that way anyway, where they cast a long shadow on our lives for good or for bad or whatever. And, you know, I kind of see that where he is on the one hand, I think it's just like what you said, kind of like his dad is his Jimmy Stewart or George Bailey to him. He doesn't necessarily want to do all the things his dad did, but he does want to be a good man like his dad. And and it's a real interesting thing because it, it kind of brings up this idea of can we really be who we want to be without sacrifice and compromise, uh, without being willing to give up things in order to do what's right? Can we fully purchase – is that the purchase price to be that person? Can I be the globetrotting, really cool guy who is really focused on his own wants and desires and also be really selfless and have this interconnected web of all these people whose lives I've changed for the better? Um well, I think yeah. we see with the uh, you know Mary's other suitor. Uh, I forget the the character's name. He has that that he-haw, terrible that guy like he haw thing he does yeah. throughout the film. Uh, that's well, why she didn't marry him when George wasn't there. By uh, the way, that's I a very good reason. I, I think he haw soured is. it. 
uh, you know, even him, he, he's not a bad person and he, he comes yeah. through at the end. Uh, I think he's what, you know, call from London or whatever, uh, that they're able to extend $25,000 credit to him or what have you. So, sure. uh, yeah, by no means a bad individual, but, uh, I think the way the film portrays him is he's not a man of any substance, uh, at all. Uh, he's just, he's kind of, uh, he has no real true passion except where he can, he can make a buck. Yeah. And in some ways he's, he's, uh, even more cynical than Potter. I don't know. Potter huh. at the very least, like, you know, it's pointed out he has enough money. Like yeah. there's still something else driving him other than just financial, um, you know, means. And I don't think with that character, uh, he, he cared at all what he was into. Clearly it was, it was Bailey's idea. And he just sort of stumbled into it. It's an interesting idea. I've never really thought about that. But as you're saying that, I'm thinking about what George was looking for. He's got this kind of like hole in his heart that he thinks world travel or being a big important man and building a beautiful building or whatever could fill. And and it's interesting because you're talking about that as like this uh, – uh, is it Charles? Whatever it is. Um, hee-haw, dude. You know, he's obviously chasing something else. He's gotten out of Bedford Falls. And you're right. Like even Mr. Potter, who kind of owns a lot of Bedford Falls, is like somewhat contented to be in his little fiefdom here and just be horrible to people um, as as, as his hobby. You know, George has got the little architecture table, (laughs) drafting table, and Mr. Potter has being the worst. That's his hobby. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Potter and Bailey are both, you know, they're both wanting something bigger and they can't even explain it to other people. Yeah. Like yeah. why, you know, if if I'm one of Potter's underlings and it's like, you know, you're that old and that rich, I, I, I'm not really keeping up with what Bailey's up to. Like, I don't care like anymore. Like, I, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Like I'm, I'm retired from yeah. being vile and evil. <laughs> it's too much work. <laughs> well, you never really retire. Yeah. <laughs> I got to no, focus on my the road economy. baseball team this year. You know, that, that sort of thing. I find other things to do. Right. Well, exactly. So you see that where that's interesting as there's a part of human nature, human psychology, where we get, um, and, and, you know, there's this brain chemistry kind of thing with, with dopamine, where we get a rush of dopamine for things that we accomplish and the things that we become familiar with give us less and less of a rush. And they think that dissatisfaction is one of the things that, that actually makes us, you know, drive and explore and build and educate ourselves and become better. Uh, but it also has an inherent trap to it, which is that we can never feel like we are complete. Uh, and, and that's, you know, you see that, and it's very interesting. One of the most effective things I think they do in the movie is that device with the little knob on the staircase when he is walking up the stairs, and here's this knob that he's never fixed probably never has time to fix it. It wouldn't be that expensive, but it's one of a million things around the house, an old house, and I'm a person who's busy and has an old house. I identify with this when I walk by that certain thing and say, oh, gosh, i got to fix that one of these days. And here he t- you know, picks it up and he curses it, not actually cursing, you know, but can't stand it, this drafty old house. This, And then, of course, with his new perspective, that same knob, when he rushes past it, pulls it right off again, and looks at it and I think kisses it even if I'm not being too dramatic, <laughs> too dramatic he, for it's a yeah, wonderful I mean, life. He, he, you know, he definitely signals that it's like, he's happy. It's there. It's yes. like the, everything that is old and tired at that point is good it, because yeah. it's just like, he's craving something familiar at that point. He's, yeah. He wants it back. It, it's, it's an interesting thing that I, and I think that uh, it, it kind of ties in, with the desires that he had when he talks about you know he talks about travel and and that's always what had stood out to me but only recently when I've rewatched it have I noticed that he that architecture piece where he really wanted to big build uh, build big buildings and big beautiful things and I think one of the things we're supposed to get is this psychological reframe that he goes through where he realizes that his family certainly and even his drafty old house but to a certain extent uh, all of the relationships that he's built, that, that Bedford Falls really is his big, beautiful building, that that he really has been doing the thing that he's been driven to do and wishing that he could do. He's just done it with humans instead of of, of buildings. Yeah, and is that, a, uh, is that a, a happy ending or is that really dark? I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's happy. I, I think it's happy. It's uh, potentially fulfilling. I, I think it's probably poignant more than just simply happy. Um, and, and you could tie it in. I mean, a therapeutic point of view would be to say, 
you know, what's your expectation and your self-definition? Do you define yourself by, I got to do exactly what I wanted, or I got to use those talents and skills that would have been good over here in building buildings in actually building people's lives, you know, building a community and doing things that I thought, oh, yeah, whatever. But, oh, yeah, whatever meant the significant difference to other people's lives. I think the uh, truly selfless moment that uh, happens in the in the film, because clearly that the what happens at the very end uh, is about you know the very survival of him and his family uh, as well as as well as the town, um, is the moment when his brother uh, comes back from school and announces that he's married and he takes this new bride aside and says so what is this you know plans for this new job and he he inquires not oh, only is it like yeah. you know a good paying job but there's that important detail where she reminds him that his brother like this is something he's going to be great at like this is great yeah. for him like it will be something that uh he is satisfied with like as a you know a dream job for him and i think that's a very important detail to have george bailey recognize that and sort of uh give that gift to his brother allow it not really call in that yeah. that debt wanting wanting to give him the experience and the uh, opportunity that he w- wasn't really able to have himself right in a way. right and you know it's it's kind of interesting cuz we all have what we want at face value but there's also a big part of, it, of of our own psychology is what does that represent really? What's the symbolic representation of what we want? Why do we really want it? Why does he want a big build building? I keep saying that. Build big buildings. I keep saying <laughs> big build buildings. He wants the big build buildings. So, uh, yeah, why, do, why does he want that? Why does he want to travel the world and see things and go places? Um, what's, on, what's driving that? Now, he's not a real person, so we can't ask him. But <laughs> interestingly enough, if he really wanted that at the exclusion of everything else, he would have said, well, tough luck. I mean, it's your deal. You were supposed to come do your bit at the savings and loan, or I'll hand it off to somebody else. It's been a few years since Potter. I'm going to move. I'm going to leave. I'm mm-hmm. going to do whatever. You know, he would have walked out that door and said, well, sorry, guys. You're voting with Potter. Screw you guys. You guys are, you know, uh, betraying my father's memory, and he was a good man, and I'm going to, you know, just head on out into the night and and you all inherit the problem that you created if that was his major desire so sometimes we curse what we choose because there's a competing desire and i would say for george bailey like he felt better giving his brother the opportunity than he would have felt taking it himself i think there's some other guilt there that uh is coming on at the end when he's on that on that bridge and that um because he never you know, whatever fates, you know, conspired against him, he was never allowed to or just chose not to. Uh, there had to be that secret fear that for as much as he sort of talked big game, that, as you said, it's sort of vague what he wants yeah. to do. Like, there are big plans, but there's nothing specific about those plans. Like, he wants to go everywhere. And right. he wants to big build, <laughs> big build, yeah, build big buildings. <laughs> now it's caught on to me. Now it's there, yeah. Uh, uh, he basically, you know, he wants to go pee in the snow. He wants to mark his territory somewhere. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a way of Capra making people feel better about, you know, the things that are in front of them as opposed to these, you know, basically like I want fame and power. I, it, because when people say that, like, you know, when you're a teenager and you say, I want to be a rock star or a movie star, even if you have no really creative sensibilities, you're basically right. just saying, I would like to be famous. And I would like to have a, a sort of a, a life that people because it aspire just to. seems right somehow. It seems like that's Money. what I should want: money, <laughs> power, women. right? Yeah, accessibility, yeah. freedom, options. Um, but the steps to get there, yeah, you know, that's problematic. Like oh, I have to learn how to play guitar. I don't really, I don't really enjoy playing guitar. Like I, and, you know, I don't really want to do that. You know, and it's funny in a way. It goes back to what kind of kind of what I was saying about like the savings loan or even the humanitarian efforts. But it's the same way with somebody who makes it really successful at a thing. Usually, it's because they like the doing of the thing. Like they want to go out and like a lot of, of successful musicians. You got ones that are better at business sense than others, but they would go and play, and play for free. Like uh, like doing a podcast, right? <laughs> yes, they would do it. Be- yeah, exactly. We're now you and I are making big bucks doing this, but you know, not everybody uh, <laughs> is as savvy as yep, we are. I'm going to retire to uh, Potterville after right, this, exactly. after a few more episodes of War Machine versus War Wars. I'm yeah. done. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, doing that thing, and and not just being like I'm really good at guitar. If it's a musician, wanting to 
uh, you know, make the whatever sacrifices are involved in that and knowing how to market yourself and knowing how to go places, knowing how to do things. There's the doing of it. And I think you're right. Like a lot of his fantasies are really were just fantasies where this seems like what it would take to be an important man. And in reality, though, and, and probably because of internalized values, maybe from his dad or just whatever, he being a good person, he has has uh, uh, done what he really wanted to do, which was stay and help. That was that was always his pre- he, his prevailing uh, drive and and deeper value, if that makes sense. So when you say what did you want to do, a lot of us focus on the oh I wish I was a rock star, I wish I had been an architect, I wish I would have been a veterinarian, whatever. And it's like, but what did you do? And and you did what you did for some reason because it made sense at the time. It's as simple as the uh, the sign being different on that bar. Like, that really affects him there. That's like, wait a minute. Like, you know, I, I helped that family. I helped them, like, buy their first home and yeah. run a successful business. They were able to achieve their dreams. And that I think that really scares him. That uh, more so than Nobody just was there to do know, that. people being meaner to each yeah. other. <laughs> it's like that mark is gone. That Maybe that's the first time he ever thought I helped put that there. And yeah. he had never really considered it before. Well, and you can tell that he has – part of his value system really is caring about whether or not the people have a place to live. You know, Because obviously he's doing it and um, – oh, gosh. Now I'm blanking on the name. It was called Potterville. What was it called? It wasn't called Baileyville. Uh there was was it Bailey Park? Bailey that, Park, that, that's that's what it was. section. Yeah, yeah. Well, he didn't put a ville on the end of it, but yeah, Bailey Park. When he was when he was building all of that, that he really did care about whether or not they had a place uh, to live, and that that was meaningful to him. And so, yeah, I think you're right. When he sees that, he realizes, oh, I thought I was like the last person to keep this miserable savings and loan afloat, but actually, I was this key part of a of an important community of human mm-hmm. beings who needed somebody to stand up for them. I want to talk about the ending a little bit. Because uh, I think that because it's a story and because it's Hollywood, uh, we have this very, very visual, powerful demonstration of everyone's appreciation. Um, and I don't know – I think one of the problems in real life is that we don't see the ripple effect of how we affect other people for good. And so therefore we don't believe in it. We think, well, of course, you know, then that story, because it was all, but he did all these dramatic things. And it's like, well, they had to have something to show, right? They couldn't show that time where he just kind of was nice to somebody and it made a huge difference or where somebody said, I guess I can go on another day because that coworker of mine, you know, I heard them tell a story or something like that. Just these little things. We don't see them, so we don't believe that we have an impact for good. We very rarely. I don't. I don't. I don't know if I've ever had a time in my life where everybody's rallied around and said, "Hey, we heard you're in trouble. Let's all. Everybody's here to support you." Um, and I don't want to. I don't want to discount. I've had very. You know, I've been. I've been very blessed in my life to have supportive family members and people who care about me on an individual basis. Sometimes even a few of them at a time. But to have everyone come and the whole town come in and say, "You know, Mary just said George was in trouble, and everybody had to come." You know. And so I don't know we get that satisfaction oftentimes in reality. Well, in, in this particular you know, story, they all have skin in the game to a certain extent as far as like he's had a hand in them you know, financially helping them out. So yeah. there's that reciprocation that's not expected, but they expect sure. it of themselves. Like they, you know, they, they choose to do so. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I watched that and that, that's what really, you know, gets me all, all weepy and why I choose to yeah. watch this alone with the door shut. Like only me and my dog and even my dog, I don't allow him to like look at me as I'm watching it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a deeper male masculinity. Uh, we, we can talk about that off the air. <laughs> Another episode. Um, I, I do think that uh, now we're, you know, we're more connected than, than like really, you know, even though we don't, I don't know about yourself, but I don't live in a sort of community that's like bedford falls and i even grew up in a small town and i still i you know i just wasn't i wasn't walking the main strip there and could see like everybody if i just you know went three blocks oh no um, me neither no i don't have that yeah uh, Say, oh there's but, mr gower there's mr so-and-so there's right. yes oh someone owns that place i guess would be more would be uh, yeah, my thought so this is certainly putting it in that context that you know small town where everyone's connected and sort of in each other's business is it's a good thing because it you know it works to his favor everyone becomes quickly aware of his situation and offers help 
uh, now I guess the equivalent would be something like Facebook or something mm -hmm. like social media where everyone is somewhat in your business, but you would probably just get a quick little comment. And I think we devalue it because it's so easy for people just to say, thinking about you, you know, hope things turn out better. Let me know if you need anything. I'm here for you, but well, you're not really there. That sort of thing. So much so that we dedicate like hours of time um, uh, fighting and, and being dramatic about whether or not somebody put a you know put the french flag over their their profile picture or put the gay rights uh, logo yeah. and 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 on both sides of that you know where someone's willing to argue that you really should or you're a bad person or you really shouldn't because you should be doing more and and that people are going to fight about that to where it's yeah it, that it that it just kind of seems silly well and you know it's interesting as you're saying that i'm thinking about all the opportunities for that community that do exist though i think um i mean i don't know think about anybody out there who who's listening who uh if they attend a church, that's a potential community. If they, uh, you know, if they have any kind of network of coworkers, uh, their Facebook community, if they belong to things like that. Um, and, and it's funny how quickly when we find a group of nice, like-minded people that people really do want to become friends and they do want to connect. And, and, um, and so it, it is interesting where we... On the other hand, you know, we usually when we watch a movie like this, we think about being George Bailey, but I kind of think about being in that crowd. Are we the type who we get that call, George needs help, do we actually run over, do we do, we do something? Do we say, I want to be part of that crowd that's supporting George or whoever George is in this case? I think we, you know, we'd like to think so. Um maybe it uh, you know takes something like this where it's like, hey, this man <laughs> You know, he's going to go, he's going to go to completely. jail, right? He's going to go to jail. Uh, and it's also Christmas and he's got three kids and wife and, you know, we've grown up with this man and his family. Yeah. Um, I think there, you know, there are smaller defeats uh, where you don't really, you don't rush over. You don't, because you don't really understand what they're going through. And it's also, even here, I, I really like that, you know, George Bailey, he isolates himself. Like he, yeah. he feels ashamed uh, about, you know, failure and, uh, it really does marry that sort of lets it through. You know, the 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 harder edge version of the story is that people don't really know what he's going through. Like he he stays isolated, um, and you know there is no Clarence that that comes and sort of you know saves him. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I'm like you. Like I I think that's why you know it tears me up. I I you know I want to believe that's that's I would be surrounded by friends and family that uh, would do something like for me, or that I myself would. You know, I want to yeah. believe that I'm one of those people. Yeah, and I think that's I'm I'm just like you by the way. I I just and and I'll tell you what. Um uh, I don't know if you have any kids, but especially once you have kids, uh, if you're a crier at movies and uh you know, whatever, all of a sudden you go from if you're already a crier at movies, you you go to being a crier at commercials. At least that's been my experience. <laughs> Be like, "Oh, you know." And and I I get that all the time. Um I remember when I watched uh, Finding Nemo uh when it came out. Yeah, I was. Uh, I think my wife and I were dating at the time. Maybe we were just married, and we went and watched it because it was like, oh, that's cool, you know. And then uh, I watched it on on DVD with my son when he was like five, you know. And he's like, "What's going on? What? Why did he? Why? What's he doing?" And I was like, "He's he's gonna go get his son back," you know. <laughs> and it's just like I don't remember having that experience the first time I watched it. So right. So it only gets worse, just so you know, um, as you get as you get. That's, this is the the holiday episode I want to be a part of. Then it only gets worse. <laughs> yeah, it only gets worse as it gets better. Let's say that you get. Um, I had a therapist friend of mine who used to always say when people would say, uh, you know, the phrase, uh, "Well, I was I I was watching if it's a wonderful life, and then I just lost it, right?" And he would always say, "You mean you found it." Which is a very therapist thing to say. Uh -oh, it's one of the things yeah. that makes people roll their eyes at therapists. But I always kind of liked that. Where it's like, no, you found it. You've actually found yourself in one way that you don't usually experience yourself, uh, where you're sitting there and crying. And and yeah, I'm the same way because you see that and you're like, I, I just hope that people would be there or that I could be there for someone. And um, so I guess that I mean that's that's one thing that with with all the parts of this movie that are dated. That's something that I think we still connect with and probably why it's still so popular is that desire to, to have connection with people, to be healthy, to be supportive, and to be supported. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's certainly a number of these classic films that have those sequences that sort of give you pause uh, as my dog starts growling. <laughs> um, but I, I think this one holds up really well. Like, it, it's a deserved uh, classic. Um, 
I, I really don't have bad things to say about it, although my dog does. Um, <laughs> He's your co-host on your show, right? That... Well, it's because I wouldn't allow him to uh, invest in that moment. Like I, you know, I was not allowing him to to cry with me. Um, <laughs> That's yeah. I I think that it's. I, I, th- I think it's got a lot of different like layers to it, uh, which uh, you don't really expect from a Frank Capra movie. Really, like it has that sort of like uh, there's that you know Capricorn is kind of like a catch all, uh, kind of almost a put down where it's like oh yeah that's just that that sort of you know happy like you know Christmas dessert that cookie to make you feel good like and put you in that Christmas spirit. But I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of darkness in this this movie, and it's not just you know George Bailey overcoming it because you can imagine a version of this film uh that goes on for another 10 minutes and so after they've got the financial obligation sort of taken care of yeah what he has to sort of sit with what he experienced like that vision he had like and how does that affect him going forward like that he knows that these people that he's grown to love and care for and help out <laughs> that they're on that sort of razor's edge of becoming just complete, you know, asshats. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, uh, there's still a crossroads there is, is what you're saying. And, and essentially, because yeah, you can take that that way and, and kind of that type of worry and, and even increase in the pressure. And yeah, then, then again, I guess there's also that, that, other way and and it's funny because the other way to go on that would be for him to say oh you know my life will be like this and it is like this because when he started to explode and uh, more implode i guess as he's even thinking of ending his life uh one of the things that it seems like is that realization that it's not going to change uh but now he has the opportunity to celebrate that and to say it's not going to change and it doesn't need to would be a very different life to do and so that would be threatening in a way as well but also much more healthy and i think i don't know we all we all kind of like to imagine that we have a lot of control in our lives and and to really say oh you know a lot of the things that have happened to me and have pushed me in a compromising position to to compromise and sacrifice uh, might actually be the thing that make my life valuable and to accept that means he, he would have the opportunity to be much more fulfilled and happy but it's also a challenge it's very i don't know in a way it's kind of zen and you have to try to live your life that way without trying to change it. I assume he would not be walking around with that uh, that that anger that he's never allowed himself to release because he, he certainly releases it on that particular Christmas right. uh, in a very Jimmy Stewart way. Yes. Like he just, as you said, just sort of grumbles. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, he would – I think he would feel better about himself, but uh, he may – you know, he may question – the the idea of Bedford Falls even more because I do mm. you know I'm 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 looking at it and I'm like you know if, if that's all it takes I think that's a that's a positive look outlook on George Bailey's character and strength but sure. it's also a negative too it's like you know it's like how <laughs> I guess I'm I'm the cynic here's where the cynic comes out <laughs> there you I'm go like, yeah. if it just takes one man to shape this small town and their viewpoints and how they they treat each other then God help us. Like, you know, how many other small towns don't have a George Bailey around? <laughs> yeah. A bunch of little, little, little dark crossroads there. And so, <laughs> yeah. so I guess, you know, the other, the other way, the other way to lean on that too, is like, like I said, where it's his beautiful building, like, you know, Oh, I built, I did build something, you know, I built something that's actually going to stretch onward and think of all the, the people who won't grow up with, you know, awful Nick as a father now, because I did this. <laughs> It's all it's all perspective. Hey, that's the message. It's all perspective. So I, I mean, I guess the invitation, really, of the movie is is really to look at what we do have and what we have built, and say, is it is it about getting what you want, or is it about wanting what you've got? <laughs> I can't top that. <laughs> In the words of the philosopher Cheryl Crow, she's the one that's able to play guitar, so she's better than me. Yeah, she actually followed through on that. She did it. So fast, like a lightning flash, just a little time for a 